Weren't they good? Yeah, so uh, uh, Bruce and Lauren were playing on Friday evening at Art Crawl, and uh, it was wonderful just to throw open the doors, 747 people through the doors to come and enjoy Lauren and Bruce uh, 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 playing the duets, so duets as they played for us uh, this morning. So thank you both so much for your offering, not just to us, but to the wider Hamilton community. They were joined by, uh, um, uh, goodness, I'm just gapping it. Thank you, Adam McNeil. I don't know why I had a, a brain cramp then. Adam McNeil was playing the organ as well. And uh, Sandy, on your behalf, just while I'm at it, I do want to thank Jenny and you very much for uh, hosting uh, all those folk. You were joined by Jenny Early and Pat Barton and Jess and Willow. Where, where are Jess and Willow? Maybe still at the back of the church. Um, and there, who else was there? And Libby, Libby Simpson was as well. So thank you all very much. It's a wonderful way in which we can open our hearts uh, and our doors to the wider community and, and welcome people into this glorious space. So I often say that this building has a ministry. This building has a ministry. And if you could see the expressions on faces of folk who come in here for the first time, one guy had been living for 25 years in Hamilton no idea, no idea that this place was here. He just walked in and was lost for words. So uh, I just feel so proud that we have this space to be able to share with our community. Anyway, a special welcome to all who are here this morning, particularly any who may be with us here for the first time or haven't been with us too often. Uh, great to have you with us. Uh, we'd love to get to know you a little better if you want that. You may not want that, and that's fine as well. But if you do want to get to know us a bit, coffee hour after the service is a great opportunity for us to kind of say hi. We're not as scary as we look. Uh, I think that's enough before we get underway. Uh, for those who wish, we're going to join in the territorial acknowledgement, which you'll find printed on the front page of your order of service. And for those who don't know, everything you require for the service is in the order of service. And uh, your responses are the ones in bold type. So for those who wish, we acknowledge that we gather today on the lands occupied by the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabe nations at the time of the creation of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. We honor and respect these nations and commit ourselves to walk together gently upon this land. So let's just take a few minutes to breathe in the Lord and breathe out all that tension we've been carrying throughout the week as we come before our risen Lord in worship.
Well, once again, the warmest of welcomes to our service of Holy Eucharist on this the second Sunday after Pentecost. Friends, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. As we remain standing in God's presence, let us pray. O God, you have assured the human family of eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Deliver us from the death of sin and raise us to new life in him who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. I invite you please to be seated as we listen attentively to God's word proclaimed. reading from the book of Genesis. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land I will show you. I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and the one who curses you I will curse and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. Abram took his wife Sarai and his brother's son Lot and all the possessions that they had gathered and the persons whom they had acquired in Haran, and they set forth to go to the land of Canaan. When they had come to the land of Canaan, Abram passed through the land to the place at Shechem, to the oak of Moreh. At that time, the Canaanites were in the land. Then the Lord appeared to Abram and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built there an altar to the Lord, who had appeared to him. From there he moved to the hill country to the east of Bethel, and pitched his tent with Bethel on the west and I on the east, and there he built an altar to the Lord and invoked the name of the Lord. 
and Abram journeyed on by stages toward the Negev. The word of the Lord. This reading is taken from a letter of Paul to the Romans. The promise that he would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or to his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. If it is the adherents of the law who are to be the heirs, faith is null and the promise is void, for the law brings wrath but where there is no law, neither is there violation. For this reason, it depends on faith, in order that the promise may rest on grace and be guaranteed to all his descendants, not only to the adherents of the law, but also to those who share the faith of Abraham, for he is the father of all of us. I have made you the father of many nations, in the presence of the God in whom he believed, who gives life to the dead and calls into existence the things that do not exist. Hoping against hope, he believed that he would become the father of many nations, according to what was said. So numerous shall your descendants be. 
He did not weaken in faith when he considered his own body, which was already as good as dead, for he was about 100 years old. Or when he considered the barrenness of Sarah's womb. No distrust made him waver concerning the promise of God, but he, he grew strong in his faith as he gave glory to God, being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. Therefore, his faith was reckoned to him as righteousness. In other words, it was reckoned to him were written not for the, his sake alone, but for ours. Also, it will be reckoned to us who believe in him, who has raised Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was handed over to death for our trespasses and was raised for our justification. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord be with you. And also with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Matthew. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. While he was saying these things to them, suddenly a leader of the synagogue came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. And Jesus got up and followed him with his disciples. Then suddenly, a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak, for she said to herself, if I only touch his cloak, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her said, take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly, the woman was made well. Then Jesus came to the leader's house and saw the fl flute players and the crowd making a commotion. He said, go away, for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl got up. And the report of this spread throughout the, that district. The Gospel of Christ. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ.
our Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. Amen. You may be seated. At the center of our Old Testament passage this morning is a verse which draws our attention to a point. And that point is the promise made to Abram and Sarai by the living God, by the Lord, and Abram's response to that promise. In the Hebrew, uh, verse, verse 7 uh, is a beautiful, um, well, it, what it is is a chiastic sort of bit of writing that guides the eye all the way to the middle, all the way to the middle of the verse, which has um, God making a promise to Abraham and Sarai, this couple, and Abram responding to that promise. Um, verse 7 is bracketed by uh, what is called an envelope. Um, and that envelope in this verse is the appearance of the Lord. So right in the Hebrew uh, scriptures, right in the text itself, God's presence becomes like a shelter in which God enters into to make a, ba- uh, a pledge of fidelity to this couple and to their children and to us who are numbered among those children as Paul uh, so, so desperately wants to make clear to us in, in his letter to the Romans this morning. Here's the Lord's promise again. The Lord appeared to Abram and said, to your seed I am giving this land. And Abram, he built there an altar to the Lord who appeared to him. The whole passage, uh, that is the whole passage uh, in chapter 12, is, I find profoundly moving uh, when you consider Abram and Sarai's uh, state of affairs. The front end of this passage in 12 speaks of Abram and Sarai heavy with possessions but with no past and no future and sojourning in a land that is not their own. They have no past because they've just left Haran. Um, God has asked them to leave that place. They have no future because this couple is barren. And again, they are sojourning in a land that is not their own at the moment. And to me, as I was meditating on that passage, I thought that that is sounding a little bit... um, familiar to me. Um, I can't help but meditate on on our own state of affairs when I hear this passage, especially um, in light of this last week, the many fires that um, that we've had across the country. We are a wealthy people, um, and in many ways we are without a past, and we are without land, and we are without a future. Um, we are, in many ways, we are trying to come out from our past. We are trying to learn lessons from our past and distance, it from, uh, distance ourselves from it. Some are feeling called out by God to reconcile, make reconciliation with the past and with uh, our, own, our, own, um, our own ways of infidelity in, 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 the, in our past in Canada here. But we don't really have a landing place because uh, this land is not ours. And in a very frightening way, we are doing something to our future um, in which it's hard to know if seed will take in the land that we are entering into. It's a very um, interesting place to be. It's a fascinating time to live with so much and yet so little. It's a very religious time to live. I hear lots of promises being spoken over us atop billboards these days throughout our city. And I see sacrifices being made in secret as people slip through the cracks. Particularly, I'm thinking about our housing, our, our housing crisis here. At the center of our bit of scripture here in Genesis is the belief that the gods make promises And we as humans, individual and as communities, respond with sacrifice. This is sort of the quintessential expression of religion. The God will give, and I'll build an altar. 
The God makes a promise, and I will bind the sacrifice. Pack your bags before you call us. What's one more statistic anyway? Abram hears the Lord's promise and begins to build an altar for a sacrifice. But if we read the story again, we'll find that the text, that is Genesis 12, is strangely silent about the act of sacrifice. What we're told for sure is that Abram builds and Abram leaves. The fire, the slaughter, the offering up isn't there in the text. This interesting absence uh, leads me to imagine a sort of awkward exchange between the Lord and Abram as Abram is finishing his altar. The Lord inquires of Abram, this is a nice little structure, where'd you learn how to build such a thing? Abram's a bit chuffed and he quickly responds back with, my father showed me how to build altars back in Haran. In Haran, you say, questions God. Yep, continues Abram, as he reaches for that final stone. Where I'm from, we build altars like this one, and then we'd offer sacrifice upon them to the gods. As I imagine it in my head, as I go through this little exchange between the living God and Abram, I see Abram stand upright, stone in hand, and I see him face to face with God, And the realization that perhaps he didn't quite leave everything behind when he left his father's house and his father's gods. Abram standing before the Lord with that altar's cornerstone in hand. What does he do next? Because he's kind of caught in his response. That is the response of building an altar. The the, the altar is a bit awkward in the presence of the living God who envelops him, who is standing right before him, who has appeared to him. A burnt offering, literally a going up, olot in Hebrew, seems a bit absurd an act for a God whose presence is right there. There is no need to lift anything up. Abram and Sarai stand before the living God. So then, what then if not sacrifice? What then if not burnt offerings? What sort of steadfast promise is this? What sort of God pledges faith in this way and abides with this level of intimacy? I will give. That's the Lord's promise. The Lord who appeared to Abram and Sarai at a time when they had no past, no land, and seemingly no future. Which is a lot like follow me. A promise of sorts made to Matthew at the tax booth in the gospel passage this morning. Follow me. Matthew, another man rich in his poverty with no past and no future um, and no land apart from what money can buy, but radically homeless from his kin now that he serves the empire. It's fascinating that Matthew follows Jesus right to a dinner party with people reclining at table. There's a wonderful culinary theme running through our text this morning. I'm reminded of one of my uh, beloved teachers who reminds me that there is an agrarian theme running through all of Scripture. And if there's an agrarian theme, then there's a theme of food running through Scripture too. In the first passage, we have a ritual sacrifice laid upon an altar. It's a meal that implies a great distance between God and the worshipers. Remember again, the literal meaning of burnt offerings is olot, a going up. The food, the meal, ascends to wherever that God is, and the worshiper is a servant who is uh, essentially setting the table for that God. In the gospel, I think it's contrasted in our readings today. We have a spread 
uh, prepared for a table around, around which many recline at. Many of different stripes and, uh, you know, just many people. The religious leaders there, the sinners are there, those who are pledged to the Roman Empire are there. And Jesus is there too, right in the midst of it all. It's a meal that is brimming with intimacy as guests crowd in together and become a sort of support for one another's bodies. I'm sure some of us have seen pictures of what these meals look like. It's, it's almost arresting how intimate they are. Everyone's sort of uh, lounging and at times lounging on one another as they eat a meal. Could you imagine if we did that one day? It could be a, a, bit, a bit shocking to most of us. But it's here at that level of intimacy, at that feast, at that dinner party, that Jesus comes to the help of Matthew, the tax collector. When the religious leaders ask his disciples why their teacher keeps eating with tax collectors and sinners, Jesus responds with this, go learn what this means. I desire mercy, eleos thelo, not sacrifice, unthesion, for I did not come to call the righteous, but the sinners. This defense of Matthew could just as easily be applied to Abram and Sarai. Just as Jesus clears a sinner like Matthew the tax collector through an act of fidelity, that is an act of steadfast love toward him, whether or not he deserved it, so too the Lord makes covenant with Abram in this very important passage of the Hebrew Scriptures through his steadfast love, quite literally enveloping them in steadfast love to make promise to them whether or not they respond with sacrifice. It's this promise um, that Mary sings about, right? Um, when she refers to it as the promise of mercy in the song some of us know as the Magnificat. The full quote Jesus uses to, vent, to defend his now disciple comes from the prophet Hosea, who says, I desire, and this is, this is uh, Jesus, if, if you didn't catch that, Jesus has split a verse in, in the Hebrew scriptures in half, used the front end of it to talk about why he's eating with tax collectors and sinners. He uses the first half of the, half of the verse and then adds his own little bit at the end. But he's quoting Hosea, who says, I desire mercy, chesed, not sacrifice, the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. Chesed and um, <laughs> da'at, I believe, in Hebrew, these are the, the first, the, the latter, that knowledge is opening up for us what we're talking about when we talk about the chesed of God, the loving kindness of God. Um, understanding in the Hebrew mind is often linked back uh, into the Garden of Eden, uh, where this intimacy of knowledge between the first two humans creates another human. It's this understanding, yada, which is to know, um, which is when we really consider the fidelity of God, it is, an, it is brimming with intimacy. All this brings me back um, to our current time. In many ways, I see us holding that final altar stone, asking us, asking ourselves, what, what are we going to need to do here? If God has made this promise to us, what is the sacrifice required? I was thinking about the way um, Paul meditates on, and, and he meditates on this because it's in Genesis, the state of Abram and Sarai's bodies, the old, 
dried up. Sort of just like our, like our, like the creation, like the creature. God's promise abides with us to give us a place that we can put our feet on, that we might serve and observe, which is the first calling of the first human, the first command of the first human in the Garden of Eden. This is for us to have a home, a place to which, to which we can stand. And as we're standing with our altar stones, enveloped in the presence of God, we're wondering if it's not sacrifice and distance The choice must be to reciprocate that mercy which we've received from God. The choice is to mirror that fidelity that we have received in Christ. It's what we see um, with Matthew following Jesus. Um, The woman uh, hemorrhaging for 12 years It's her faith, pistis in Greek, that saves her, that makes her well. The the religious leader of the synagogue comes to Jesus trusting that if Jesus comes, his daughter will be saved. You see the three women there in our stories? Sarai, the woman hemorrhaging, and the young daughter, sort of intergenerational mercy. In the Psalms, there's this theme that, recur- that reoccurs, and I'm sure it's in the prophets too, which the only acceptable sacrifice is thanks. Offer the sacrifice of thanksgiving. It's why we anchor our worship service at the table and enjoy a meal together. As we come out uh, from this meal today, I'll leave you with the words from James who says, Um, true religion um, is to look after the orphan and the widow in their affliction not as a sacrifice but as a, a sort of sending out for we have received great mercy and we should give it too I invite you please to stand with me as you are able as we affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father, through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. I invite you to take your preferred posture for prayer. Each intercession will end with the phrase, God of promise, and the congregational response is, hear our prayer. God of promise, hear our prayer. 
hear our prayer. God of promise, you reward the faithfulness of your people. As Abram did, let us hear your call and respond faithfully. God of promise, we pray for the church and we hold in our hearts those named in the Anglican cycle of prayer, the Anglican Church of Canada, the Evangelical Lutheran Church in Canada, and our Diocese of Niagara. God of promise, we pray for our political leaders at all levels of government. May they have the creativity and resolve to address the many issues confronting our country and community including the grave challenges of affordable housing and homelessness. God of promise. As a community, we pray for prisoners, especially prisoners of conscience, and those politically who are unjustly imprisoned. We pray for Mother Superior Marguerite Amon of the community of the Sisters of Church and a member of this parish who ministers in the Solomon Islands, a part of the world so vulnerable to climate change in the form of cyclones and flooding, sea level rise and saltwater intrusion. We ask for forgiveness for all the unreasonable demands that we have made on the earth. Stir our hearts into action as global temperatures rise. Inspire us to make positive differences in our homes, church congregations, communities, our investments in the world around us. God of all life, inspire the leadership and people everywhere in the worldwide Anglican Church to act on our theological reflections about creation and to live up to our responsibility as protectors of God's earth. The need is great, the consequence is profound, and the timeline short. God of promise. In our parish cycle of prayer, we pray for Helen Wright, Norma Wright, Fahima Youssef, Patricia Ziegler, and Thomas Ziegler. We pray also for those who have asked to be remembered in our prayers and whose names are listed in the Chronicle. God of promise. The flowers, <clears throat> the flowers last week were given to the glory of God and in living, loving memory of Seymour and Noreen Weigel given by their sons and their families. The flowers this week are given to the glory of God and in loving memory of David Fickley, given by Kim and Michael Johnston. God of promise. There is much trouble in the world and it is easy to feel despondent and powerless. Let us celebrate the promise of God's power working in our lives and in our world. Amen. Jesus said, before you offer your gift, go and be reconciled. As siblings in God's family, we come together to ask our Father for forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart, we have not loved our neighbor as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Would you please stand as you are able? Christ is our peace. He has reconciled us to God in one body by the cross. We meet in his name and share his peace. Friends, the peace of Christ be always with you. We exchange the peace with those around us as best we can.
Standing we pray. Merciful God and Father, in Adam's fall we were born to death. In the new Adam we are reborn to life. In all we offer you this day, may we share a taste of your eternal kingdom. This we ask in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right that we should praise you, gracious God, for you created all things. You formed us in your own image. Male and female, you created us. When we turned away from you in sin, you did not cease to care for us, but opened a path of salvation for all people. You made a covenant with Israel, and through your servants, Abraham and Sarah gave the promise of a blessing to all nations. Through Moses, you led your people from bondage into freedom. Through the prophets, you renewed your promise of salvation. Therefore, with them and with all your saints who have served you in every age, we give thanks and raise our voices to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy God, source of life and goodness, all creation rightly gives you praise. In the fullness of time, you sent your Son, Jesus Christ, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He healed the sick and ate and drank with outcasts and sinners. He opened the eyes of the blind and proclaim the good news of your kingdom to the poor and to those in need. In all things, he fulfilled your gracious will. On the night he freely gave himself to death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he'd given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Gracious God, whose perfect sacrifice destroys the power of sin and death, by raising him to life, you give us life forevermore. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Recalling his death, proclaiming his resurrection, and looking for his coming again in glory, we offer you, Father, this bread and this cup. Send your Holy Spirit upon us and upon these gifts that all who eat and drink at this table may be one body and one holy people, a living sacrifice in Jesus Christ our Lord. Through Christ, with Christ, and in Christ, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory is yours, almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Now as our Saviour taught us, we pray. 
Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. We being many are one body, for we all share in the one bread. My friends, these are the gifts of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. So this goes to Canon Sharon, please. Okay.
Why don't you please stand as you are able. As we pray. We have shared in the mysteries of the body and blood of Christ. Nourish us by this feast that we may live the risen life and serve you faithfully in the world. Amen. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation in the church and in Christ Jesus forever and ever. Amen. I invite you to be seated briefly for our announcements. Uh, we were blessed uh, this morning with the uh, presence of the Reverend Rob Miller. For those of you who don't know, uh, Rob served an internship here with us last year. Uh, he leads the St. Luke's community, which meets in the uh, former St. Luke's uh, uh, church. And uh, uh, we're good friends. We, we are good friends with the St. Luke's community. And we're good friends with the Reverend Rob Miller. And Rob, thank you so much for returning this morning. As I said to you at the earlier service, it's lovely to see the way in which uh, God is growing your gifts uh, in the ministry of the Word. And uh, I, I found particularly helpful this morning that little imaginative piece right in the middle of your sermon to unpack that understanding of promise and uh, uh, that, that kind of imagined exchange between God and Abraham as... Uh, the kind of the sacrifice didn't happen and what that was all about. So uh, uh, thank you so much and, and welcome home. You know this is uh, always a place you can call home when you need to, okay? Uh, right next to the Reverend Rob, for those who can't see, is the Reverend Monica Green. You! So it's all official now. Um, Monica was ordained, Reverend Monica was ordained last Sunday at four o'clock in the afternoon, along with five other candidates, I think. So uh, uh, one, one, it was a wonderful celebration, uh, Monica, and the best news of all, for at least selfishly, is that we get to see a whole bunch more of you across the next 18 months. Uh, for those who weren't here last uh, Sunday, uh, Wendy Newman, as a member of corporation, read a letter from the bishop appointing Monica, uh, the Reverend Monica, I should say, I'm going to get used to that, uh, as our curate for the next 18 months, beginning in August. So uh, we're just beyond delighted, Monica, to have you both with us uh, for uh, uh, the next little while. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so uh, just a couple of other things I mentioned before that we had a wonderful art crawl and just want to... That, you, that guy that we hadn't been here for... Been living in the city for 25 years, never known this was a place. I said to him, "Pal, this is your this is your cathedral. This is your cathedral. This is a space for the city." And I can't impress upon you strongly enough that we offer this building as a ministry, not just to ourselves, but to the Jamesville neighbourhood and to the city. And it's a privilege to be able to say that to those coming in our doors for the first time. This community. This cathedral belongs to you. Uh, right after, well, after coffee hour, we're going to have uh, another newcomer's lunch. I am so thankful that there are enough of you joining our lives that we need to be having these luncheons every six months or so. So it's kind of a meet the family type deal for those of you who have joined us in the last little while and kind of want to find out a bit more about who does what. That's what these luncheons are for. No pressure. You don't need to have signed up. If you'd like to come along, have a bite to eat and meet corporation, meet some of the ministry team, meet some of the, those that lead various ministries, it would be great to have you along. So that's uh, noon, 12, 15-ish in the Spence Room. Just ask if you don't know where the Spence Room is. Uh, this afternoon, uh, you can see that the side altar is dressed in rainbow. And that's because we are having our annual Diocese and Pride service at 4 o'clock this afternoon. Fiercely loved. Uh, there's some signage that is not gone up yet, but will be going. So uh, again, 4 o'clock this afternoon for our fiercely loved Diocese and Pride service. We had advertised a planned giving reception uh, this Wednesday, Wednesday evening. We've decided to put that on hold. And we're going to revisit planned giving uh, as part of uh, a way of promoting a culture of generosity in our life. 
at some later date. So certainly we'll let you know uh, next steps there. And Kerry is uh, towards the back there. We've got a mental health awareness workshop on Thursday. Thank you so much. Uh, one o'clock, you've kind of tapped uh, some uh, heavy hitters from around the city who are going to be coming to help us understand a bit more about mental health. Now, the reason is that we host Cathedral Cafe Thursdays and Fridays, 10 till noon. 50 or so Kerry people are coming uh, uh, per day, are coming to that, many of whom, or at least some of whom, struggle with mental health issues. So this is a workshop, thank you so much Kerry, just to help us understand a little bit better how to interact, how to respond to those with mental health issues. That's open to anybody, but th there is a registration link on our website and on the digital version of the Chronicle. If you could fill that in, if you want to come, no charge, it's free, uh, that will just help Kerry and others with, with catering arrangements. And uh, just finally, uh, the contact is our uh, quarterly newsletter, and uh, it's just a stellar publication. I mean, I've been around the block a few times, and, and let me tell you, for a community this size to produce a bulletin or a newsletter of that quality really is something. So Sally, where's Sally gone? She was here. Uh, God bless her, is the editor. She looks after getting all the articles in, proofreading them, um, uh, uh, all of that sort of thing. We just need someone to help us with layout. That's all. You don't have to uh, ask anybody to, for, for, for an article. You don't have to proof it. You don't have to do anything else. We just need someone to help us with layout. If you can help with that, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, that's probably more than enough for one morning. Thank you for your patience. Anything else just that I have missed that needed signal? Okay, I invite you then, please to stand as you are able. The God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory in Christ Jesus, establish, strengthen, and settle you in the faith. And the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be upon you and all those whom you love and care for this day and forever. Amen. over there. People are going to shake your hand.
Go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit.